one, two, three. Welcome, everyone. How are you, Gustavo? Great, and you? All good. Uh, for those of you who, I mean, we're three people in the call uh, and in the video. For those of for those watching the video, I mean, who are you, Gustavo? Because it's the first time you've been on the podcast. You're a new face to to the K Fan team. Explain a bit who you are and what you do here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you for inviting me, Jaime. I'm the venture partner ahead of Latam for K Fund, uh, trying to find nice opportunities and make connection for K Fund, especially living here in the region. Where are you based? I'm based in Sao Paulo, but we've been working all the way from Mexico down. So Rio cool, Grande okay. down and all the way to Patagonia. Very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for those of you who have not listened to the last episode, and we explained this a bit, uh, so we launched a new fund in April 2022, so April of this year, which is called Litwin. And it's it's like a nice evolution of KFUN, what, what we had been doing for, for a while. So basically now we can write checks from 100K to 10 million, and not just in Spain, which is what we tended to focus on, but also in LATAM and, and Portugal, Southern Europe. And that's why that's why Gustavo is super, super helpful. Um, the other guest that we have today is Victoriano of Graphics. How are you, Victoriano? Pretty good, pretty good. Is that your house? A nice yeah, house? Yes, or is it good. the graphics office? No, it's my house. <laughs> I'm at home today. Okay. And our guest today, and the one who has like interesting things to say, who we have interesting things to ask, hopefully, is Antonio Molins, co-founder of Justos. How are you, Antonio? I'm good. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Thank you for coming. So, so before we get into your background, because we usually start that way, why don't you tell us like one, the one minute pitch of, of what Justos is so people can understand what you're up to today. And we'll go into Justos like later during the podcast, but what is the pitch? Yeah, so Justos is an insert tech uh, focused in the Brazilian market. Uh, we are currently doing um, non-professional auto insurance. Uh, and the interesting part about us is uh, we use technology um, both for the risk assessment, so trying to identify good drivers, or better put, trying to identify bad drivers that shouldn't be uh, into into a product. And all the all the experience, all the customer experience is is um, going through the through the app. So use the quoting, the binding, uh, the claim servicing, and so on, just within the app. Uh, by using technology, we can reduce the price of insurance uh, and uh, and provide a better experience. So the long term view is just um, building the insurance brand uh, for Latin America. So we get into we'll get into more detail about Justus in 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 a moment. But you have a very interesting background. I mean, both in terms of your. Uh, educational experience, but also the companies you've been on. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't have LinkedIn in front of me, but Airbnb, Netflix, Clarity. Explain a bit more about your background. Where, where did you grow up? What did you study? And what path did you take into the into the tech sector? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so here in Spain, I mean, I grew up in Spain uh, until I was 24 years old. Uh, I studied telecommunications engineering, uh, but I was a uh, little bit of a weird telecommunications engineer because I focused on med medical imaging devices. Uh, my parents are both physicians, uh, so I had had access to all the interesting machines uh, that take pictures of your insights uh, in, the, <laughs> in the hospital. Uh, and I got really interested in that to the point that my, my master's uh, thesis project, uh, I built a... Um, uh, Tomograph, uh, like a CAT scan, uh, was like using both X-ray and um, positron emission tomography. Uh, so that was a really fun experience uh, on hardware. I just built the thing from scratch as well as programmed the software. Um, when I finished my master's, uh, I started my PhD uh, here in Spain in telecommunications, um, but they wouldn't let me uh, take uh, med school classes as well. Uh, which I wanted to take because that was kind of like the point. I wanted to understand how to how to make better medical imaging devices. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a little bit frustrated with my PhD because I couldn't actually study what I wanted to study. Um, so I started reaching out to some people I knew from conferences and so on and um, got somebody uh, that was associated with the 
Harvard Medical School and MIT in Boston uh, that um, allowed me to like take an internship there. Uh, so I sold my belongings and moved to Boston and started working with, with this person, with uh, Vasilis and Chakivistos, um, on optical tomography. And there is, there is a point to this. So when you're doing x-ray, uh, the kind of like the inverse problem, so like recovering the volume from the projections is easy because x-rays go straight through your body, right? Uh, so you get kind of like the line integral of density, <laughs> if we want to get technical, mm -hmm. but when you go with light, light um, diffuses in biological tissue. So things get blurry and you start having to do more probabilistic inference. Uh, so I got more interested in the math than in the hardware. Uh, and that's kind of like how things continued from there. Uh, within Boston, uh, I applied and got accepted to a dual degree uh, between Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So I was doing engineering at MIT and med school at Harvard. Um, and I did that for a number of years. I focused on functional neuroimaging. So I wasn't taking pictures of anatomical features anymore, but I was taking pictures of brain activity. Um, uh, and I, I did that for, for my PhD. So in the process, I got a uh, Masters in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science in MIT, then a PhD in, uh, well, actually two PhDs technically, one from Harvard Medical School on Medical Engineering, and one from MIT in, uh, in Computer Science, electronic, uh, ele Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Um, so that takes us to like around 20... To 2009. Uh, uh, sorry, one question. Uh, how developed is that area of understanding the activity on the brain? So, Neuralink, all of these things are, what do you think about that? <laughs> what that... do you think about Neuralink? I think that Elon Musk has really good PR, uh, okay. but what they are doing is just kind of like an evolution, not a revolution of things that uh -huh. were already very much in place. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the interesting part for me was that. Um, when I was doing, so, so basically my, my PhD was about uh, using modalities that have low spatial resolution, but very, very big um, temporal resolution. So I was doing electroencephalography and magnetoencephalography and kind of like leveraging the temporal resolution to get better spatial one. And in order to do that, you start uh, having to model and this is going to get very technical, Jaime. You have to stop me. It's okay. It's okay. No, 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 no. It's okay. Totally fine. Yeah. Totally fine. Um, it's very but interesting. Basically, in order to, to leverage the temporal resolution to get better spatial resolution, you have to do inference on what is the process that generates the images, right? So uh, one, one example is like if you were uh, taking a picture of a, the, the front of a washing machine at any given point, uh, you could see bits and pieces of clothing, right? And you could get another picture that has a different view on the same. If you know that all humans know that those things are connected because those are physical objects that don't break and, and, mm -hmm. and dissolve, you can infer exactly what's in the washing machine by looking at a video, but not with just one picture, right? Mm -hmm. um, the difficulty here is that the actual process uh, of the brain activity is not very well known. So you actually have to do uh, model identification on top of, right? So you have to try to figure out what the physics of the, um, of the brain activity are by looking at the pictures. And if you infer that right, then you get better estimates uh, mm -hmm. all across. Um, so that was kind of like what my PhD thesis uh, was about. Uh, and that was very interesting because getting those better estimates had implications in uh, the medical treatment of people. So, for example, for people that have epilepsy uh, and uh, do not respond to drugs well, um, you use this type of techniques to identify the motor cortex very finely. And that's important because in epilepsy, at some point, the only thing that you can do is literally kind of like burn uh, at a small part of the brain that is kind of like originating the attacks. And that may or may not be a good idea, depending on whether 
uh, by removing that piece of the brain, you are going to render the person tetraplegic, or, mm -hmm. right? So, so that was what was exciting for me, right? Like we were using math to get better estimates and those better estimates were actually getting much better outcomes for people that had um, a problem. Super interesting. And are you optimistic about the future of this? I mean, is it developing faster now or is it? Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> you want to get into... Uh, I mean, it's just a, Do you think a... this is going to be something that in a number, a couple of years will make progress in this type of problems? Um, or... Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, like there's a lot of progress in like getting a kind of better, better estimates of activity in the brain. Uh, now the question is whether that is going to let us understand the brain at mm. any rate, right? So one uh, one interesting thing about like neuroscience is that it's gone through a uh, very different periods, right? Like there was like the phrenology before that was looking at <laughs> just like the bumps in your in your bones and trying to predict how your brain worked. Now we are looking at uh, neuro, neural activity or well, coordinated neural activity Um, but through very indirect means, right? So like things like functional MRI are just looking at the uh, hemodynamic response. So when your neurons are very active, uh, the, the brain um, oxygenates more that area, right? And it's that difference in oxygenation that we are looking at. And by that, we are trying to infer like how the brain works. Uh, one humbling way of looking at this is if you were looking at your computer, and doing kind of like a scan and trying to figure out how the computer works or what's very important for the computer by looking at what hits up, you will end up thinking that the heat sink or the reading, it would be like the most interesting part, right? Because it gets very hot. Mm -hmm. so, so anyhow, uh, the, we we don't know too much about the brain. We know much more than before, but uh, it's still uh, so complex. Um... Yes, exactly. <laughs> So Antonio, you did all of these interesting things at MIT and Harvard, and then did you ever go into the commercial side of things, or did you did you always stay on the research part? Right. So at that point, uh, I was thinking about what to do after my my PhD, uh, and actually, I wanted to come back to Spain, uh, and I had a job offer standing. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we are just picking up the pieces from the. Uh, housing crisis and all the CDOs and all this interesting stuff that um, Wall Street got us into. Um, it wasn't clear, so so I had a, I had an offer to to come back here and do um, like autopilot for drones, like interesting company technologically and interesting control problem and so on. Um, but ended up deciding to stay in the US. Uh, I was very uh, Well, this will tell you something about me. I was very optimistic that I could fix Wall Street. Uh, yes, because um, <laughs> um, I decided I decided to go to Wall Street and work in Goldman Sachs. Uh, so you didn't try to go into the commercial side of of medtech, neuros right? Neuroscience. Uh, no, neuroscience. Was, yeah, no, not the commercial side. And on the academic side, I got a little bit frustrated. I think like the academic career is. Uh, You know, some some people get an impact, but most of the people are just like trying to publish uh, and publish well, and and it's the, the the way that the publishing industry works in science is, uh, yeah, it has. But what what, what made you change to to go to Wall Street and Goldman Sachs? Like who you met or what 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 happened there? So yeah, it one, seems like a very one, interesting week. Huh. It seems like a very interesting leap, different. Yeah. Yes, my PhD advisor wasn't very happy about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I think ultimately for me, the what drives me is um, modeling, like getting a mathematical model for interesting systems, uh, right? And Wall Street was an interesting system. Uh, where I was going was... Uh, basically the control function uh, for, for, for the bank. Uh, so I wasn't a broker or I wasn't anything like that. I was the policy of the, of the brokers, right? So um, when brokers use the money that the bank lend them to play with for the year, uh, they get a cut on the uh, profit and the profit 
is calculated in the case of derivatives based on a pricing model. And that pricing model um, needs to be calibrated. So the brokers also put in the parameters that drive the pricing model. So by the end of the year, brokers have an incentive to uh, kind of like tune the model in a way that prices up the things that they have and prices down the things that they owe, right? So that they make more profit. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, uh, all banks have a, an extra layer where other people that are not brokers and they are not um, interested uh, look at the market and try to calibrate uh, the models with other data that is not exactly the data that brokers are using. Um, so that's that's what I was doing in there. So basically uh, developing and calibrating models for the pricing of uh, derivatives based on commodity volatility. Um, and I did that because I thought that was important. Uh, it was it was a time when uh, bad bad models really because like a lot of what happened with the with the um, uh, collateralized debt obligations, it was a very basic problem, right? It was a, a problem of risk aggregation. So they were like bundling together mortgages uh, and not estimating correctly the probability of all the mortgages going down at the same time, which is exactly what happened. <laughs> uh, so having a having a better probabilistic model of what the risk uh, on those derivatives was uh, was an important problem for humanity at that point, well, at least for the first one. Um, so I thought that was impactful. What year I, were you there? Was was this, what, 2010, 2011? So two, right after I Lehman? Think, yeah, I think it was, I think it was 2010. It was an interesting time because Goldman Sachs was like the uh, scapegoat <laughs> for like everybody thought that they were the, they were the 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 culprits or at least like the the, the most uh the most culpable ones uh so i was entering into goldman sachs where brokers didn't necessarily like me because i was just going there to control them um, and the outside in sukoti park uh there was the occupy wall street people camped see me entering in goldman sachs so i was um universally hated uh, inside and outside. Um, and you were there for a year, right, Antonio? I was there for a year, yes. Uh, I, so just a year because you realized changing Wall Street was not that easy? <laughs> that's why you could say it that way, yes, exactly. Like the incentive structure is there. If you, even if you remove all Wall Street, it will uh, be created somewhere else. But also because a friend of mine um, told me that uh, he really, really liked this this company he was moving into, somebody that I really respected, and he was going to Netflix. Uh, Netflix, I had known about Netflix because of the um, um, Netflix price. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware of this, but like Netflix did a public competition where anybody could participate, and they were giving a million dollars for whoever improved by 10% uh, the, the recommendation algorithm uh, predictions, right? So... This is before Kaggle and all these like kind of like um, massive um, machine learning contests, uh, and they did have a lot of impact with this initiative, right? Like, uh, I think it took them a number of years to actually give a million dollars, but like with that million dollars, they got uh, most of the best universities of the world uh, competing to solve the problems. Uh, and one of the universities was MIT, and in MIT, in my machine learning class, uh, Tommy Jacola, who was the professor, he was also competing. So I, I knew about Netflix because of that, um, and that was a very, very interesting problem at the time, like all these like, uh, like collaborative filtering and different algorithms to do recommendations. And there was another Spanish guy, Xavier Amatrellan, right? That was working yes, in there. Yes, Xavier entered Netflix pretty much when I did. So he was uh, on the more on the engineering side and he's also like senior to me. So like he started taking on the recommendation um, more, more on the on the platform. Um, 
and I I entered in Netflix uh, as you know like one year out of grad school, um, working on the more on the uh, design and prototyping of of recommendation algorithms. Hmm. So so, so right. Netflix culture is famous. Goldman Sachs culture is famous, and you were mentioning the academic <laughs> culture. How different was that? I mean, how was it going from Goldman to Netflix? I imagine it was a very different thing. Actually, Goldman Sachs has a very interesting culture inside, at least like where I was, right? So I cannot say anything about like the like the broker side and so on, because I think for that you have the movies. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's like in the Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> yes, but but Goldman technologically speaking, is amazing. Uh, they have their own programming language uh, mm. called Slang that uh, has a primitive, primitive type, the dollar, uh, among <laughs> integers, double, and, and so on. Uh, they have their own um, operate. So, so basically, everything that they implemented, uh, they use this, this thing called SecDB, uh, which is a lazily evaluated graph database uh, that updates in real time. So you are not, you are literally pushing to production continuously and everything, all the billions of derivatives and assets they have get reprised automatically. I mean, like the operation is, is really, is really impressive. Uh, and I was given a lot of uh, opportunity from the beginning. I mean, like yeah. one year in, I was presenting to, uh, To, to people that were like three levels up. So, so I have nothing bad to say, to be honest, about that culture. It was a, it was a culture of innovation uh, and of autonomy, and it was easy to have an impact. Um, the question is whether that, that was the impact that I wanted to have, right? And, mm -hmm. and I decided that that was not the case. Um, Netflix culture um, made a big impact on me. Uh, I was... I was very lucky to be interviewed by like Reed, uh, Teddy, uh, um, Patty McCord, who is the original kind of like creator of the Netflix culture deck. Uh, she was um, she, she was a she was a very very interesting person and with a very interesting take on how to run a company, right? Like this kind of like freedom and responsibility, they, they really, really uh, created something, something special uh, there. How big was the company when you joined Netflix, Antonio? I think around 700 people. I, I mean, don't, don't quote me. Also fairly small. Like, okay. But still, still, still a small, right? Uh, also very interesting time to uh, join Netflix. Um, so I interviewed in, when I say in August? Right, and they were telling me about this like really amazing uh, new way of structuring the company and so on. Um, when I arrived, it was it was just launched. Uh, I don't I don't know how much you know about this, but like Netflix uh, was mostly a DVD by mail um, company, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and they famously like. Uh, got uh, won the fight versus uh, Blockbuster uh, just by executing better and like being more customer centric. And that, that's really the, the, the story, right? Like no late fees because why do you want to have that better service and everything, um, everything available uh, in, the, in the store. Um, but they also had like a very small streaming operation uh, that was only working in the US and in Canada. So in the US, they had DVD by mail, which was like the big thing. Uh, and they did had some streaming. And because the library was limited, and because the quality of the internet was limited, uh, they were giving that for free. Um, Reed thought, and rightfully so, that streaming was the future. So he decided to split Netflix in two companies, uh, or two products, with two different web pages and so on. Quickster uh, was the other one, right? Quickster. Exactly. Uh, so Quickster was just starting in September when I joined. Um, and that was, 
in execution, it was a complete disaster right? because they, they split, they started making people pay for Quickster and for Netflix separately. So for the people that wanted to have the two services, the price was only going up without any new value. Um, and, uh, and and it was it was a mess, right? Like you had two different web pages, one for streaming, one for the DVDs, uh, a bigger price and so on. Um, so in the first kind of like, analysis that I was doing about the user base, I was just seeing like everybody canceling. Uh, when I interviewed, uh, the stock price was $300. Uh, when I joined, it was $50. Uh, oh. So interesting time uh, to come in, but also a great lesson in uh, leadership. Uh, so the first you know, like town hall that I had in Netflix, uh, read, just got in there and took full responsibility for his mistake, uh, came with, you know, a plan, like a long-term view of like, look, we, we have done something that, uh, wasn't wise <laughs> and, uh, but we are going to, but we are going to survive this. Um, it's also interesting that I think, I think it was in the, that town hall, but I don't know if that, it, it might have been the next quarter, uh, you know, like everything is going down in flames. And, and he also said like, um, by the way, uh, I just spent, I think, and I think it was a hundred million dollars, uh, in this TV series, uh, that was, I think house of cards, uh, at that, at the time when everything is going down, it's like, we are going to just double down on this, right? Like streaming is the future and we need good content and we need to become HBO faster than HBO can, can be us. Um, so I, I thought that was amazing, like such prescient view, but also such balls <laughs> to actually do that with a company that is just like trying to understand what is happening. But... Yeah. And, and, and how did, did, did the streaming operation pick up? I mean, you mentioned a lot of leadership, a lot of uh, internal discussion, the quickster. How did the leaders, the, the streaming operation pick up and became clear that the move to House of Cards, the move to streaming was, a, was the sure one? Well, I mean, uh, user adoption, product market fit. Uh, <laughs> and I, I don't know. I think, I mean, I think it was just a matter of time, right? Like you just needed to have like better quality in streaming and that solved partially by better codecs and better technology, but also just by more adoption of like, uh, fiber to the home and, and so on, which was a trend that was already ongoing. And um, how, how real is that Netflix use data on the behavior of their audiences for designing or having the ideas for designing the, the new contents that they produce? Mm -hmm. Is that something that is really that real or is more that they just have as any other, you know, producer connections with uh, directors, uh, when they get a proposal that looks interesting, they just go for it. Right. That's, that's an interesting question. So the full AI version, and again, I can only talk about like what I, I know because I left a number of years ago, yeah. uh, the full AI version, uh, I doubt that is happening, but what Netflix is doing and it was doing is look, we have a lot of information on like how users consume media. We know our user base very well. Uh, so we can, at the very least, price much better than the competition. What is the potential for this show, right? Because we, we, we know uh, what sector of our customer base is going to like this. Uh, we know, uh, so, so when, when doing um, content uh, purchase decisions, they were much better prepared, right? And that, and that really is the competitive edge, right? Because Netflix went from being a content distributor to a content creator. But even when they were a content distributor, uh, they could already price much better, right? Like they could say, well, this is a really good series for our customers, whereas uh, other other buyers uh, didn't have that uh, kind of like arbitrage. Uh, and also and identifying, you know, underrated directors and people creating right new new shows that that is kind of like the money ball right for for mm -hmm. for content creation right. for for that that everybody knows right that some people are probably just because who they are right they will get like 
very well paid as actors and directors and, and I think that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, on that I've always been, uh, so I spent many years and I guess we'll get to that uh, in doing recommendations for Netflix and I've been always very jealous of uh, other types of content. So like Spotify, because um, they have much larger engagement, right? Like you play mm -hmm. many songs during a given day. Uh, they have a they have a medium that is much easier uh, to characterize even with the content of it, right? Because yeah. audio is easy to analyze, it's easy to find uh, embeddings that yes. make sense to do recommendations. People tend to have a specific taste and so on, and I think that's I mean. There's many reasons why Spotify has what I think is like the greatest recommendations, um, but 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 it, in the case of of, uh, of Netflix, you have a limited catalog, uh, not that many interactions, right? Like there's so many movies you can watch in a given week. It's not um, clear who is using the account. That is your girlfriend, is, is you, is a kid, right? Yes, yes. We 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 had a number of models, but. These are the kind of things that you solve better by product than yeah. by... So in right. order to solve that, just give users free profiles, profiles right? Uh, uh, whereas as, an, as a data scientist, I would, be, I would be like, no, this is like a latent variable model. I'm going to use expectation maximization <laughs> to try to figure out. Uh, and then you realize that it's much easier to just tell them, who, who are you? Um, Yes. And, and what about the the social layer for for recommendation? I think that, for instance, you mentioned Spotify has a great uh, recommendation system for music. I like it. I love it. I use like the re weekly suggestions all the time. Uh, but I remember last FM. I don't know if you remember last FM. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I really like it, and I think it was purely based on your social graph. Like uh, they will, you will connect your Facebook account. They will get like what your friends are listening to, and they will recommend you basically music of the friends that are more similar, mm -hmm. are yeah. kind of close to you. But I, I think that recommendation system are always a balance between something exotic, something that you don't know, something new. Because I mean, you are normally excited by things that are new, but at the same time familiar. So. There must be like a yeah. relatively close distance between these two variables. And I think social sometimes is great for that. And I remember Facebook used to have the Facebook Connect or the Facebook Graph and they remove it. And I remember Xavier said something that I discussed it with Xavier publicly on Facebook once or Twitter, I don't remember. And he said something like they, they remove it because it didn't work. But I don't know. I feel like it should work. That's okay. So many things um, <laughs> so in terms of recommendations there are really three things you have to balance right one is popularity mm -hmm. uh, which is you know i know this movie because the avengers and so on right yeah. um, another one is relevance so how does this fit with the specific taste i have so i'm like a indie documentary fan that there has to be some of that and the third mm -hmm. one is diversity right so you can have a recommendation system. Even if you really like anime, you don't want to open Netflix and only see anime, right? Yeah. So those are kind of like the three three levels in there. Um, and popularity can be local, right? And that, and that local popularity, the social graph can really help you. Um, so in Netflix for a very short time, uh, Spotify was doing this thing where you connected with Spotify and then uh, in your status, it would say, well, Antonio is listening to this, Antonio is mm. listening to that. Uh, and they were claiming uh, like a virality coefficient that was bonkers, right? Like they were saying, well, you know, like for every person that connects to social graph, I'm getting like whatever it is, 20%. Uh, like a, a, for every five that we connect, we get one. Uh, if that was true, <laughs> you get an exponential exponential growth, uh, Spotify is doing well, but it's not doing exponentially well, right? Like yeah. that would be, they would have run out of humans like a number of years ago. <laughs> uh, but we wanted to understand if that was the case. And we had a, we had a test where we were doing something like that. Uh, the problem uh, in the case of 
Netflix that Spotify doesn't have uh, is that there's this thing in the US called the Video Privacy Protection Act, VPPA. Mm -hmm. uh, and this comes from, I don't remember the specific election, but there was one candidate uh, on the elections uh, that as the US is, uh, I guess it was the same everywhere. Uh, basically, they were trying to dig some dirt on him. And one of the things that they did is they went to the video store, the video rental store, and got his rental history. And uh, they, they failed, he got elected, and he put this uh, video, video Privacy Protection Act in place that has fines for every single item uh, that, 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 you, that you get on the rental history. Um, so that means that if you wanted to Facebook connect with Netflix, you had to have a user permission at a video level for each one, which wow. really wouldn't work, right? So Spotify was working, but Netflix couldn't do it. Uh, but we, we, we thought a lot about having um, Facebook connect in there. And this is something that Xavier probably saw, but like if it was an analysis I did um, on whether we could use the social graph to improve recommendations. And the short answer is that yes, you can, right? So if you, if your Facebook friends are also Netflix users and we can use that, uh, then you can get better recommendations by looking at what your friends are watching, whether the causality goes one way or another, right? Like you watch it because your friends watch it, like are like this homophily, right? Like uh, yeah. birds of a feather uh, fly together. So like you, you like what your friends like, or it's just that your friends are very persistent, like you should watch this and you end up watching it. I don't know which, which is the case, uh, but that, but that works. So I'm, I'm, I don't know exactly the context of your conversation uh, with Xavier, uh, but I can tell you that I can have, I have, I had hard data that, of course, you can you can get better with uh, with social. Interesting. This is the kind of things that at the end determines this kind of laws, right? That not many people know uh, are the type of things that change like a lot of type of products that you can design. I'm pretty sure like many people are thinking about ideas of you know. Uh, using that type of things and they, they don't know that you can use it. Yeah. So, uh, uh, go ahead, Gustavo, you were going to say something. Yeah, and these new privacy settings, how did they change that? How did this all this evolve with the new privacy? Well, I mean, it wasn't, um, it was just a boundary condition all the time, right? So we just decided not to launch because we would have to have the user uh, click accept on every sharing and that that was just not a product that would work. Oh, no, no, not that product. I mean, the artificial intelligence looking after recommendations, user preference and so forth. I mean, it was really catching up. Then Apple came up with all these privacy settings, uh, a new approach. Uh, now things are going to have to be worked around. How do you see all that playing out? Okay, so... In Netflix case, that doesn't apply, right? Because it's all proprietary data on their on their user base, and whenever you are kind of like using that for recommendations, everything is properly anonymized and GDPR compliant, and so on. You can still infer a lot of things by looking at anonymous users uh, on on the on the recommendation side, right? Um, First party data, right? Yeah. I mean, basically, as long as you are not using PII's, uh, mm -hmm. just different definitions of like what uh, uh, what an identify identifying uh, data data is, right? So there's many like there's this like key anonymity, right? So like uh, if I know this specific thing, how many people can be, right? So so as long as like you are not identifying to the person, and depending on the particular application. Uh, you, you can do just fine. But I think uh, what you are talking about, Gustavo, is, is more about like the kind of like the Apple approach uh, of not storing sensitive information. Uh, well, I think like there's a lot of interesting movements there, right? Like uh, there are a number of like uh, privacy preserving techniques that you can still use to aggregate across, right? So there are things like federated learning where 
you are doing most of the inference in the edges, right? So in your in your cell phone, and you are blending information across many devices, but without anybody actually having each other's information, so that your data is safe. But you can still uh, do recommendations at scale and learn from the base. Uh, and this is this is a very um, interesting field um, in general. And I think it's the right approach, right? Like the information shouldn't be uh, centralized. So, Antonio, you, you spent quite a while of, uh, at Netflix, if I'm not mistaken, and actually in two different stints. And, and then you, you got to director of product innovation, right? What, mm -hmm. what were you doing then? Yeah, so in Netflix, I started designing and prototyping recommendation algorithms. Uh, and I I mean, I was lucky enough to, to get a number of patents on just both in row recommenders. So, like, if you look at the Netflix UI, like, each row is actually typically a different recommendation algorithm. There are theme, there are some like because you watch, which are driven by similarity. There are some that are driven by popularity and so on. Uh, then a different algorithm, which is the one that recommends rows. So when you open the, the UI, uh, you won't see the same rows than somebody else, right? Like you will see, like if you are more driven by popularity, there will be a specific rows that make sense for you. If you are a film buff, uh, mm -hmm. you likely go for because you, because you watch, because you are, you are like, kind of like following a specific. So I did that for a while. Then I, I was leading the uh, research, uh, basically a research group uh, on recommendation algorithms. So kind of like managing the, 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 the people that were actually designing the, the algorithms. Then I quit uh, and did a couple of things for a while. So I joined my first startup. Um, and actually that maybe tells you something. Uh, so when I quit Netflix, it was the first time that I could not work. So I was in the US and I didn't have a green card, but I got a green card. Uh, and then at some point I said, well, I'm going to take a bit of a break because I've been like many years here. Um, so I decided to move to Mexico and do nothing pretty much. But then I was convinced by Jorge Soto, who is our my the CTO at Justos that was starting a company uh, called Miraculous. Um, going back a little bit on the medical application, so they had a, a technology for uh, detecting micro RNAs in blood that was cheap and uh, well, that was the hope that it was going to be cheap and uh, especially cheap the device, right? So it was more of a global health play. Uh, we were looking at creating a device for the early detection of uh, gastric cancer uh, using like a blood test, um, and and they've been they've been do, do, doing this for a while. So it was seven people, were like building everything. So we had a wet lab, uh, we had like the finance, we had the the data science, we had the engineering because we were actually doing hardware and so on. Just seven people, and I think that's really what got me hooked on the on the startups, right? Like that energy of Let's just try to build something really hard and having a lot of fun doing that. I did that for a year and a half or so. Um, and the, the company ended up pivoting to more just hardware. So, so I, I moved out, uh, went back to Airbnb. Well, went to Airbnb <laughs> where I was uh, not, not long. Um, it was a very hectic, chaotic company, to be honest. Like we had like three restructurings in seven months, uh, projects kept changing owners, uh, and I, I was becoming a little bit frustrated. Um, what year was that? Uh, I, I don't know. Somebody opened the LinkedIn. <laughs> 2017 you have here. Okay, great. Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> um, so, so I wanted, you know, I talked to the people at Netflix and they were like, look, uh, we'll just create this position for you. Uh, you can be uh, overseeing like the recommendation algorithms from prototyping, A-B testing, development, like uh, productization and sunsetting while I'm monitoring. Uh, so I did that for a year and that was, that was a really, really fun position to be at, to be honest. Um, so I was in charge of only the movie recommendations because uh, everything in Netflix is a recommendation, right? So 
we use we use uh, recommender systems for um, optimizing growth, uh, uh, in, even um, deciding which box art to use in which movies for which people, right? So like if you go to Netflix, if you look at uh, a specific movie, you won't see the same box art uh, than other people see. Um, and that was that was kind of like a different, uh, a different PM. Uh, so I was specifically going for like movie recommendations and that was, that was super fun. Mm. A lot of nice, projects out there. Antonio, there's often this debate that comes up, uh, I mean, not in Spain, but in general, uh, what's a tech company, what's not a tech company. And mm -hmm. actually one of the companies that, has, that is often referred by some people as not a tech company is actually Netflix. Mm -hmm. And everything that you're saying is actually a lot of technology, a lot of data science. Uh, what's, what are your thoughts about this, about this debate that comes up every once in a while, well, especially when it comes to Netflix and other types of tech companies? I, I I really don't I haven't seen that debate, but I can tell you that Netflix is a tech company, <laughs> and so everything, absolutely everything is um, is tech forward, right? So so I mean I understand if I understand the the point here is that what they are doing now, right? So so especially since they move to content creation. Mm -hmm. Most of the success of the company depends on the quality of the content, right? So, and, and that's definitely not tech-based, but I feel like any company that uses technology in a smart way is a tech company. Um, like, doesn't matter, you might have logistics in, like, I mean, Amazon, for me, is a tech company, but you could argue that the drivers are what's making, what's making it tick. Um, but I think for me, it's just more about, like, the the approach to solving problems, right? Uh, so are you solving your problems with technology or not? You may end up having like brick and mortar stores, uh, but how do you optimize your operations? How do you use the data that comes from there? And how smart are you in like, kind of like defining these data products that your company needs to operate? Hmm. Interesting. So, so, so then after, after Netflix, if I'm not mistaken, you did I don't know if you came back to Spain with clarity, but at least you went back to, well, you went back to Spain and you went back to the finance and trying to change finance kind of world, right? I mean, explain a bit more what clarity is. Yeah, so actually this comes back all the way to Goldman Sachs, right? So when I, um, one of the reasons that I decided to quit is that I wasn't seeing eye to eye uh, with the people at Goldman. Goldman has this has this thing called the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index uh, that lets you be long commodities without holding them, right? So basically, you can be uh, playing around with the price of wheat in Ghana from Wall Street, uh, and that very difficult to prove causation, uh, but that surely hasn't helped in the prices of commodities in in uh, in third world countries. Um, and I in was the sense, in the sense that they become more volatile. Uh, uh, that's one, or that they go up, right? Because you can be trading these things across different countries in like a specific kind of like derivative products, uh, and so I wasn't, I wasn't happy with that, and I was having like conversations with like people in there and like the universal, and and these are smart and nice people, but at the end, like their justification was like, well. Uh, if we don't do it, somebody else will do it, right? There's money to be made here. And I'm like, and and that's not something that I was comfortable with. So the I like the what what's called externalities, right? Like the consequences uh, of your trading or, or your finance of your financial um, movements that are not reflected on price. Uh, it was something that was interesting to me and I've known Rebecca uh, Minguela, the like the founder of Clarity for a, for a long time um, and when we were discussing and we were discussing kind of like on and off what to do next right uh, and this idea of Clarity uh, came came up um, it, it was very interesting to me so what Clarity does uh, I mean like the current it's a SaaS product for the measurement, optimization, and reporting of sustainability uh, in investment portfolios. Uh, 
Uh, so if you are like an asset manager or an asset owner, uh, more and more you have the need to report on the sustainability. So um, there's different frameworks for that. So there's this ESG, which is kind of like the financial, the financial one, which is environmental, social, and governance. Uh, there's also the impact angle. I don't, I don't know if you want to get into like the differences, but um, the, there's an important difference, which is ESG is uh, how much impact can the sustainability practices of the company have on the company, right? So is this company at risk of uh, um, going down because they have bad governance or because they are exposed to the price of oil or, or because they don't? So impact is different. Impact is like, how is this company helping the world uh, improve? Right. Uh, and so and one is externalities and the other one is not. Kind of, right? So like you have the extent so, so it's just it's more about like how you analyze it. So like you are mm -hmm. you are a company that is lowering their carbon footprint, right? But it's still high. Uh, you are you you this may or may not be important for you as a company, depending on how important that is for your business, right? Uh, or also depending on where are you at. So uh, if you are a company that has a big carbon footprint, you are emitting a lot of, of CO2, right? Uh, that is more important as a company, but the company might be doing exactly the same thing. If you are in Europe, where the regulation is stricter than if you are in India, but you are emitting this to the air and the air is shared across the whole world, right? So that's where the ESG is, a little bit different from impact, right? And, and there's many, many other differences. But um, anyhow, like we, we had been talking about this for years, like Rebecca and I, uh, and then she went and did it, started the company and told me, Antonio, uh, are, you, are you in or not? <laughs> so uh, I, had to, I had to make a call. So I decided to, um, to move back uh, to, to Spain to work at Clarity as a uh, chief scientist. So I was doing kind of like the data science and machine learning uh, on the company. Were you also one of the co-founders or, or not? No, no, not technically. Oh, okay. So Rebecca founded the company. She took, uh, she took all the risk uh, with her job, uh, started the company. Uh, and not only that, but also got like a, like a, uh, an important uh, like grant uh, from the European Union uh, so that we could uh, start operating. So Rebecca is the is is the the only the only founder. Sorry, Gustavo, you were gonna say something. No, don't worry. And how was it going back to Spain after all that? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Bittersweet. <laughs> well, uh, I'm I'm very happy that I'm here. Like all my family is here. I'm the older the oldest of uh, five siblings. We all get on very well. Uh, so family and being close to family is amazing. Um, after whatever it was, sixteen years uh, away and kind of like surrounded by very weird people, uh, Spain. It it took a while to find. Uh, my tribe, uh, but uh, but I mean, uh, quality of life uh, is amazing. I w I'm not going back to the US, um, but it's, uh, it's the a you, very you, you miss diversity of, of people, of different ways of looking at things, right? I guess. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, you that, know, that, that's the most common thing I, I, I saw from other people that go and live abroad and get, they come back, right? That they miss that, that diversity of people of, with many different ambitions as well right um, um, and yeah <laughs> yeah it's, it's yeah it's a very different it's a very different mindset right like i mean you come from a world where you think everything is possible right like i can study medicine and study engineering and build this company and do this thing and so on and and you land in a place where people are happy uh but they are not really <laughs> of like thinking this way exactly. uh, and and they yeah so i mean now it's great uh it takes a while to find your tribe and it doesn't help to have two years of covid uh, <laughs> straight when you arrive uh, but uh but i'm i'm very i'm very happy that i'm here 
uh, and I think um, sure maybe like like-minded people are far and few between but to be honest same is true for the US it's just that uh, San Francisco New York and Boston concentrate yeah. <laughs> like all from, of them uh, from Nebraska <laughs> it's not like it's exactly yeah <laughs> And Antonio, so so you do you do medicine, you do finance, you do entertainment with Netflix, you even do a bit of travel and, and, and biotech with the other company, and then and then with Clarity, and then at the end you're you're doing insurance right now and insure tech. Yes, I, I think you mentioned before that you, you that you run into your co-founder at the at the biotech company, but how what's the origin of the of 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 Justos? How how did this come about? Yeah, so. Um... The Justus CEO, Daval, has a very good post on this. Uh, so Justus was going to be the third company uh, that I was at. And we all have, have them. So I met Jorge. Uh, well, I met Jorge and then I worked with him in Miraculous. And I met Daval around the same time. Uh, we, came, we, we became really good friends. Uh, each one has their own kind of like entrepreneurship journey. Uh, but we thought very, very similarly about what was important in a company. And for we had long conversations, so just so it happened, I was like um, thinking about leaving Clarity. Um, Jorge was thinking, uh, well, uh, Jorge was already thinking because he was like doing a fellowship in jail, uh, just taking time off and Daval was available. And years ago, we had already like mentioned, like, look, if we ever do something, it has to be together. Um, so first, even before thinking about which specific vertical, uh, we knew that we wanted to do it together because we had a very clear idea of which type of company and which type of culture uh, we wanted to create. Uh, so it is not the case that all the startups have a... a, a healthy work environment, right? Like a high pressure, fast moving uh, thing. But we thought that we could get a company where um, people could do their best without uh, burning out, basically. Uh, so, so and, and we are very complementary uh, in both in skills, but also in kind of like, yeah, emotional skills, uh, interpersonal skills, professional skills. Uh, so, so we first decided that we wanted to do something together. And then we started deciding what it is that we were going to do together. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we, we started a WhatsApp group where we were like, kind of like discussing ideas. And just for you to get a taste of like how different uh, <laughs> the end result was, uh, the first idea uh, was doing... Uh, vegan substitute of serrano ham uh, <laughs> for the Spanish market. <laughs> Very for close to insure tech in Brazil, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, was that so, your idea? No, it was Davan's idea. Uh, okay, okay, Davo. I'm not big. I, I think serrano ham shouldn't go anywhere. I don't, <laughs> I don't want the vegan substitute. Um, so, but we did kind of like this exercise where we were like on a weekly basis, each one of us would take like a specific vertical, trying to figure out like opportunities and then pitch to the others, right? So we we went through hundreds of uh, ideas. Um, Daval had lived for eight years in Brazil. He speaks perfect Portuguese. He has a good network there. As a matter of fact, he started at some point like a small VC fund, VC founder. Um, and Jorge and I like the idea of like having an impact, uh, not in the US. I mean, Europe would have been fine, but I think like the US, for me personally, is a saturated market in, mm -hmm. in many ways. And uh, if you are trying to optimize for impact, there are better places, right? Like people in the US already have good lives, uh, but technology can specifically help other countries better and even like make them leapfrog. Um, so, so we, we started looking into opportunities in there and, and we ended up on the, on the auto insurance market for, for a number of reasons, uh, but mostly, so insurance is not uh, compulsory in Brazil. So seven out of 10 cars are not insured uh, and like kind of going in the road. 
um, which seems crazy uh, to me, right? Like one of your before the house, the largest investment you do as you are like kind of like getting uh, better in life is the car, right? It's the car, then the house, and uh, losing losing the losing your vehicle might mean selling you back again to whatever poverty level you you were at if you don't have insurance. Uh, so we thought that was interesting. Um, we uh, we also saw like companies doing interesting things with uh, with technology for insurance, although not in the right markets. So uh, there was a company that uh, back when we were starting was was doing okay. Now it's doing terrible. Uh, called Root uh, Root Insurance, uh, where they had a similar model to what we ended up using at Justos, which is okay, um, before buying, you are going to take a driving test. Uh, the driving test is in the phone. We just use the sensors of the phone to uh, figure out location, speeding, swerving, heartbreaking, and so on. Um, and and just kind of like give you a price commensurate to your risk, not to your demographics, but to your risk, right? Is so, this something that you do, Anthony? Yes. So that's okay. something that Justos does. And that's especially relevant in an underpenetrated market, right? So like if you are in the US, everybody's insured or in or in most of Europe, everybody's insured. So it's easy to get a sense of like which type of risk you are because you have previous insurance history. But if you don't have any of that, uh, then a driving test makes sense to open up the market at the right price because you can do basically two things. Either you figure out who are like good right drivers and then insure those at a reasonable price, or you try to open up to everybody at a much more expensive price, uh, which is not fair. Um, so, so we thought that that was that was an interesting angle, uh, and then also we saw that um, in Brazil specifically, they've had a lot of success in the banking area, opening up to to tech companies. I mean, like obviously, like uh, Nubank is the uh, the king of, of, of that. Um, and the superintendent at the time for the kind of like the uh, uh, insurance uh, controlling uh, group um, was very open to innovation. Uh, and Brazil had a, uh, it still has a sandbox, a regulatory sandbox where you can apply for an insurance uh, license with a uh, much reduced uh, kind of like capital requirements, right? So opening an, opening an insurance company is not easy. It's a heavily regulated market. You need to have capital and, and so on. Uh, but the bar was much lower uh, for, for, for Brazil uh, at the time. So we decided, okay, well, this is interesting. Uh, I like the idea of like using data to um, understand driving uh, also improve hopefully the the driving of of, of our users uh, by like kind of like behavioral nudging and, and also rewards um, and we like the the impact idea so so we decided to go for that uh, we, and yeah that's... And, how, and how's your experience been going starting a startup in Brazil in a regulated industry in Brazil? I, I, I'm, I'm loving all of it. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, working with, working with, uh, Brazilians is, uh, gives me joy every day. <laughs> uh, that's, a it's a very, it's a very interesting and warm culture. Uh, there's a lot of, um, the, there's like, I mean, professionally, there's very, very good, uh, very good people. So like you can grow like a, a, a good company, both like in kind of like in terms of engineering, in terms of growth, in terms of you, you name it, uh, great professionals. Um, and to be honest, the, the regulatory part uh, was indeed great. Uh, so early on, we were having meetings with regulators because we were um, planning to apply for the sandbox. Uh, and we were having meetings with regulators that, that seemed like a dream. Like the regulators were asking us, okay, what, what can we do to make this easier? Uh, which is not the type of, of meetings you have. Um, the thing that was harder, so 
Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Justos where we are at now, right? Uh, so we have thousands of customers. Uh, we have 90 people working in the company. We are a fully distributed company and we've been since inception. As a matter of fact, we raised and closed our, our first financing round. We hired, I think it was 10 people, maybe eight people. Uh, we started kind of like the incorporated the company. Uh, we had directors and we still haven't been to Brazil. We did, wow. I, we did that here. <laughs> I was here, <laughs> Daval was in Barcelona and Jorge was in, in where was he? In, in, in upstate uh, New York, right? In Yale, New Haven, sorry, yes. Mm -hmm. It's a very modern approach. Yes, uh, incredible approach. I, I, I didn't think that was possible. Uh, what, so. what percentage of the team is now in Brazil? Uh, around 50%. Uh, so, and then we have uh, many and people. You are around 100 people I saw on LinkedIn? 90, yeah. Yeah. Uh, nice. So we have people in Spain, in Brazil, in Dominican Republic, in Colombia, in Mozambique, uh, so. And how big data. is the? Sorry. No, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I, I was just gonna ask how big is the the data team or the engineering team as a whole? What, how was the structure of the? Yeah. So engineering is the is the largest team, um, and then on the data team, I think now we are. Is it larger than thirty percent of the company? Yes. Okay. Yes. Is that is that the definition of a tech company? I would yeah. say yeah. I've, I've seen <laughs> I've seen like uh, lately a lot of data, a lot of startups, um, and teams that engineering teams that are larger than thirty percent tend to be like more big tech companies. I would say. Yeah, um, I I think I mean we are intentionally uh, trying to keep so. So in insurance, uh, obviously you have to do like the servicing of claims and so on, right? Uh, but also you have to you have to grow, right? Um, and one of the things that we've been intentional about is not turning the company into a sales-driven organization, right? Mm -hmm. We we want to be customer-centric. Uh, we listen to our customers continuously. We have interviews with the, with customers every day, um, but from the point of view of product and not from the point of view of Saints. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. that Learning is... Learning about the problems. Yes. Understanding yes. who are the users, that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we we want to scale with uh, uh, with technology, obviously with uh, technology-enabled humans, right? No, it's not all technology, uh, but just trying to make uh, great contributors more efficient instead of just hiring a huge sales team, for example, right? Or a huge operations team. Mm -hmm. uh, so our first reflex is always like, is there is there a way to solve this with with technology? Um, and I think that in the long run makes for a very different company, right? I think like, I mean, to your previous point, Jaime, like that's what Netflix was doing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's why, uh, I don't know if this is still the case, but definitely it was like they have, they have the largest revenue per employee uh, out of all publicly traded companies. No. Um, I didn't know that. And that's a sense of how to scale with tech. And it's probably yeah. important that one of the co-founders is technical, right? <laughs> two, actually. Two, two, two yeah, right? yeah. Two but at least, at least one. Well. At least one, I would say, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think the... I mean, having seen some now uh, I think companies and the company culture end up being a very clear reflection of who the founders are and how they behave among each other right mm. uh, and that's and that's why um, I deemed it more important to decide first okay I'm doing this with Jorge and Daval than what it is that we are, are we doing ham or are we doing insurance doesn't matter with this team we'll get it right uh, it's a little bit extreme, but I really, I, I, that's how I... I start with who? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, that's exactly how the, how Daval's post uh, was titled. Start with why? No. Start with who? 
<laughs> yeah, we'll link it, we'll link to it in the show notes. I think Gustavo, you have a question before the the last two. Yeah, after working with data with large data mining pools for so long, how would you say humans are are are, are predictable or not? I mean, <laughs> you would be the most guy, the the, the, the I mean, best guy to answer that. Well, I'd I'd say in the aggregate we are extremely predictable. Uh, in the individual we aren't right. Uh, so in most of the things you do, you are going to be aggregate. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I know what we are going to do next. Um, I, I think the... Um, um, are we tweakable? Uh, are we yes. tweakable at least? Yeah, so so one of the things that... Uh, let me see, what's, what's, what's his name? Uh, the Homo Deus... Uh, Juval Nahari? Yes. Uh, so I, I saw him saying something that Harari. I think was very, very true, which is um, it's not that the computers are going to predict you very well. The problem is that we have very little insight in our behavior. So uh, computers uh, are going to be dangerous in the very moment that they predict you better than you do. But most of us don't have a lot of uh, inciting why we do the things we do, right? So, yeah, exactly. You are, so you even, are if, if, even if we are predictable, I mean, if we are not able to understand why, like, why we behave that exactly. way, it's not very actionable, right? <laughs> Antonio, this has been great. Last two questions from our side. One is for you to recommend a book or some other kind of content. It can be startup related or not. And for you to also recommend a person to invite to the podcast that hasn't been on before. I didn't think about the second question. Um, so on the book, it's very clear to me. There's a book called The Beginning of Infinity. Oh, uh, I'm starting to read in it like now. Like I just like, right. bought so it this, this week. A good friend of mine recommended it to me last great. week. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that book I've read many times. Uh, and not an easy book, uh, but it's amazing. Uh, it's by David Deutsche. Uh, is one of the fathers of like um, quantum computing, but the book is not about quantum computing. Uh, the book is about everything, really. Uh, he has a very interesting point of view. Uh, so he will tell you about why why do we perceive beauty and why democracy doesn't work in different chapters. Uh, and uh, I promise you that you've never seen an argument that is similar to his uh, so that's that's a great book to read um, and then on a person uh, I I don't know have you interviewed uh, Rebecca no she hasn't been before no, no 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 so maybe that's one recommendation for you like since uh, I think you focus on like uh, kind of like Spanish entrepreneurs right um, yeah all right, Antonio, Gustavo, uh, Victoriano, thanks a ton, but especially thanks to you, Antonio. This has been great and, and great to great to finally meet you. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Bye, Gustavo. Bye, Vic. Bye, bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.